Now, Rupert and Joseph have always seen themselves in a one-to-one -one relationship with nature and with the universe. They are individually motivated, in a sense, loners. They shy away from large groups. Nevertheless, it was surprising to many that these two stayed here during the flood. To some, it seemed quite foolhardy. In one manner of speaking, however, Rupert and Joseph were quite prepared. Since the Bay of Pigs, they had kept a small pantry of stocked food, pure water in old wine jugs, candles, and a transistor radio. But they were not, quote-unquote, looking for a disaster. Before Rupert became involved in psychic work, he wrote a short novel, Bundu, in which nuclear destruction had taken place. For reference, he read up on requirements for survival. Later, at the time of the Bay of Pigs, the necessary supplies were purchased. Quite as a matter of course, household habits were such that those procedures were maintained almost automatically. There was always a stock of candles and food and water. No stress was laid on these provisions. When the flood came, however, Rupert and Joseph found themselves, in that way at least, prepared to go without help from the outside world if necessary. All of this had to do with past conscious decisions and responses to situations that, in your terms, no longer existed at the time of the flood. Yet the pattern of reaction was clear. They had decided to face any great crisis together in their own territory. The beliefs that led to their decision to stay had not changed in that regard. The one-to-one -one feeling of involvement with nature operated strongly here. They would take their chances then on individual bases. Now, they were used to working alone, even while together. In their artistic endeavors and psychic work, they were acclimated to trusting themselves. Their past involved camping out, and at least once in very primitive surroundings. This, again, deepened their intimate sense of relationship with nature, and encouraged their tendency to go along with it, to survive within its context, rather than combat it. With this set of beliefs, attitudes, and background, their decision to stay was highly predictable. They knew there was a third story to the house they lived in. Therefore, they planned to move our manuscripts, Rupert's writings, and Joseph's paintings upstairs if the need arose. Other elements were also involved. For one thing, of course, they lived on the second floor. The crisis brought many of their attitudes into critical awareness. The situation did become so serious that for a while they did fear for their survival. In those few moments, they saw their life situation clearly and brilliantly in symbolic focus, for they were isolated, with nearly ten feet of water rapidly ascending and carrying with it the odor of fumes that could be combustible. They had told no one in authority of their decision to remain, and had instead closed all the curtains so that others would not be aware of their presence. At the moment of their feet, help from outside was impossible. Helicopters could not land. They found themselves alone with the Seth material, their paintings, and other manuscripts of Rupert's. They had been using a mild version of self-hypnosis to produce a calmness and reduce any panic. But it was Joseph who suggested that Rupert quote-unquote tune in to discover what could be learned about their situation personally. Now, because of their knowledge and temperaments, they had already begun to play cards, to distract their conscious attention, and to drink wine to help reduce tension. Rupert then went into an altered state of consciousness, and quite correctly foresaw their situation. The bridge, a mere half a block away, would collapse, but they would be safe as long as they did not panic and try to leave. The crisis would be over by five o'clock, even though the news media would not realize it. As soon as the information was received, both of them felt more at ease, and the panic that had at least threatened vanished. They were left to observe the physical phenomenon, still watching the waters rise, but with the inner knowledge of safety. Rupert needed the experience in order to gain added faith in his own abilities. Both of them needed the assurance that those abilities are natural and can be used in private dealings with nature. Rupert also found that he had put himself in a position in which he had underrated the importance of physical manipulation. Both Rupert and Joseph are very mental people, however, and so they sought out this physical meeting with material phenomena and solved the problem according to their beliefs. Now, those who have a great faith in groups, who work primarily with others, left their homes immediately for the comfort they found with the companionship of their neighbors. Rupert and Joseph discovered their own attitudes in a crisis situation, 
clearly delineating their psychic position. They were led to question why they chose to face the flood alone. In other terms, the flood waters became the waters of time and of the passage of the phenomenal world. Despite all natural personal problems, they had taken their stand. The waters receded, as Rupert had predicted. They were forced to face the aftermath. Joseph helped physically as the other tenants returned to their apartments. He worked at the quite physical labor involved. Both Rupert and Joseph threw open their two apartments. A couple was given shelter in one apartment, while Rupert and Joseph confined themselves to the other. Here, they found themselves in daily intimate contact with others in a way not usual for them. This particular situation made clear to them important insights that were invaluable. It also showed them that through their relationship, they still did interact with others. For a short period of time after the water receded, there were excited radio recommendations. Clinics were set up, and the populace was told that tetanus injections were imperative. Again, Rupert quote-unquote tuned in, altered his state of consciousness, and was told not to take them. Joseph was not to have them either. The unconscious knowledge was given, and statements of each body's condition. Both were safe, as long as the shots were not taken. In this case, Rupert and Joseph acted in direct contradiction to authoritative radio statements, and held their own, despite the fact that others in the immediate environment rushed off to the medical centers. They placed their lives on the line. Only an hour later, the radio announcements completely changed. People were told that they did not need the shots, and that indeed the inoculations would cause severe reactions. Again, Rupert and Joseph gained necessary confidence that would be used in other areas. In ways too numerous and personal to enumerate, the conditions of their lives became clear to them. They did not enjoy living in a cold, sodden environment for several weeks. They did not look forward to all the inconveniences involved, and yet for their own reasons, they chose to be part of the flood. Only a few days before it took place, Rupert was offered a television engagement in Baltimore and refused it. Their car was submerged. Income from Rupert's classes was lost, yet these side effects were chosen quite in line with Rupert's and Joseph's conscious beliefs, habits, and practices. The same applied to everyone else involved. On symbolic levels, a flood represents a washing away of the old, of course, the sweeping power and energy of unconscious forces, and the resulting emergence of new birth. The fact is that your society often involves you in petty annoyances and problems that do not bring out your full strengths. Disasters often serve as encounters with nature, in which you can experience the great power and range of your own identities in a situation in which you are pushed to the utmost. In a highly materialistic society, the loss of an expensive home and other material possessions is a matter of great practical and symbolic nature. Many individuals, therefore, sought out that experience. Many also found themselves reacting with a heroism that they did not realize they possessed. A sense of community unity was born, a deep feeling of companionship that had not existed earlier. War has often served as an emotional stimulus, as an escape in terms of drama, excitement, and belonging for those who have felt alone, powerless, and isolated. In its own way, a neighborhood fire serves the same purpose, among others, and so does a local or regional disaster. The nature of your conscious mind demands change and dramatic meaning, a sense of power, and aspirations against which to judge individual direction. A quote-unquote perfect society, idealistically speaking, would provide these qualities by encouraging each individual to use his potentials to the fullest, to revel in his challenges, and to be led on by his great natural excitement as he tries to extend powers of creative potency in his own unique way. When such opportunities are denied, then there are riots, wars, and natural catastrophes. A sense of power is any creature's right. I speak here again of power as the ability to act creatively and with some effectiveness. A dog chained too long often becomes vicious. A man who believes his actions have no value seeks out situations in which he uses his power to act, yet often without worrying about whether the action will have a constructive or negative effect. You cannot act positively if you cannot act. 
you do not understand the nature, then, of your own energy or your ability to direct it. Storms, say, or tornadoes, are brought about by angry men precisely as wars are. They are simply versions of the same phenomena. The flood represented a mass psychic symptom projected upon the earth. In a quite natural manner, all of those involved not only chose the situation, but helped in the quote-unquote healing process that still continues. But you can no more separate yourselves from the body of the earth and its conditions than you can from your own bodies. Though it may not seem so to you, these are all creative procedures, and corrective ones. You intuitively feel a great connection between your individual subjective moods and the weather, yet you attribute this to mean that you are reacting to exterior physical events that exist quite independently of yourselves. This is hardly the case. When you move from one area of the country to another, it is because you have changed, and so you are drawn to others with the same kinds of beliefs and needs, attracted, therefore, by entirely different natural situations. You will then help perpetrate the quote-unquote characteristic climate to which you travel. End of chapter.